Hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning, Michelle. Hi, guys. So um, I'm here all by myself. So I took my mask off. Happy Thursday. How are you? Hi, Yotsin. Hi, Uriel. Hi, Hala. I forgot to get my prize from last time's trivia, Miss Ellis. I forgot. What? You did? Yeah, I forgot from yesterday. I'm sorry, but I went to Beaverton High School already. I took my Alpha test from my advanced CLD class. Oh, okay. So you're gonna come. You? I don't actually know where that is now because I think the library closed. So let me track that down. Good morning. Hi, oh, good morning, come in. Good morning, Dotson. So are you coming over today, Kenneth? Um, I'm not sure. I hope. Okay, I'll find that bag and put it in the main office. All right. Let me let me write myself a note. So we're just gonna wait a minute and see um, how many more humans come to class today. There's no one in here, obviously, because I'm not wearing a mask. I hope that you are well. We'll give it like three minutes. Hey, so Emily, I am uh, recording all by myself and I don't know why the wrong recording was in there. I, that is beyond my capability because I, I copied the one again and put it in there and it still says that it's the Durham Trivia Day, which does you no good at all. So I don't know. Um, the wonders of Canvas on any given day are uh, interesting. We're waiting uh, two more minutes. In the meantime, you can contemplate this question that I have up on the board. I think you can see it, can you? Yes, you can see it. Uh, what kinds of injuries will destroy your touch receptors in your fingers? So last class, we talked about the fact that you have these cool ends of neurons in the ends of your fingers that can sense pressure, cold, heat, pain. So what would what kinds of injuries would get rid of them? There's Davis. Hi, hi Davis. So how are you guys, put in the chat, um, how are you guys are feeling about, there's only one week of school left. So weird. How are you feeling about it? Sad, happy, enduring it, enjoying it. You're a year older now in class, so there's no seniors anywhere on campus. So I'm sad, oh yeah, you know what, Kenneth, I do too. And um, we had, um, I miss everyone too. And we had um, the nurse assistant students have been on campus because they have to, to finish all their clinical skills for their state board class. And um, then they had a little like, sort of a party with a little slideshow yesterday, uh, day before yesterday. And it made me lonely. I felt lonely for all, cause that's the kind of thing I would normally do at the end of years. We'd have a slideshow of our labs and like stuff that we did. 
And so I miss you too. And I'm looking forward to school being normal next year for you. It'll be normal again for you. And we'll have a lot of people in the building. Okay. Well, let's, uh, we don't have very many peoples here today, but that's okay. I'm sure we'll get some late starters. So um, any ideas on question number one? What kinds of injuries? So remembering that if we're talking the cross section of your skin, remember this drawing? Oh yeah, I remember. Yeah, you remember this drawing? So oil glands, uh, a hair follicle, the three layers. So, you know, epidermis, um, dermis, hypodermis, below the dermis. And so you have a nerve root. Let me make it a different color. That color. You have a nerve root that comes up from the bottom and then these cool little um, branched receptors. So um, in order to damage this receptor, uh, the most common injury that would really destroy it would be heat. And I mean like a really good uh, full thickness burn, like, um, on a, on a stove and uh, it would have to be somebody who was able to leave their hand on the stove, not a second degree burn that isn't gonna come down here and sever this area right here. In which case you'd have a little numb spot on your finger that you can't feel. The other thing that, that can do it is um, frostbite. So if, it's, if your hands get extremely cold, and remembering that nerves need blood supply. So here's my nerve bed. Here's blood supply. Um, if I freeze these blood vessels and they're not able to bring nutrients up into this area, that can also destroy the nerve over time. So I just love you to think clinically because um, to be honest, I think that's why you're in the class is because someday you want to. So um, I like these little questions. I love these thinking questions. Don't be surprised if you see one on your test. Need a minute to, to make pictures. All right, so then what else are we doing today? I'm gonna to review midterms because tomorrow, just to review our schedule. Tomorrow, um, midterms test only. Come and take your midterms test. I think it's worth 25 points. It's a lot of points. Um, midterms test tomorrow. And remember, it's not just the what of a word, like what is it, but why should I know it? Why should I know about it? Um, and then I'm going to show you a couple of very short videos, one on just what is multiple sclerosis. I promised we would talk a little bit about it. And then even better, what about getting a diagnosis and a guy named Neil who, who gives like a nine minute video, just talking about what it was like to interact with doctors. And he has um, some complaints about the way he was treated, which I think is such a good thing for future providers to see uh, what patients, um, and do you guys know that what I mean by provider? What does this mean when Miss Ellis uses this? Yes, Emily, that it means that you won't have goosebumps anymore if you can't, if you have no nerves in your fingertips. So um, what does Miss Ellis mean when she says, oh, future providers, what does this mean? Very quiet out there today. I think supplying futures materials stuff or something like that. Okay, so yes, yes. So the, the term provider means someone who supplies and what, when I use the term provider in, the, in terms of medicine, I'm talking about providing services. So like right now, I'm providing nursing services to a friend of mine who has cancer. I'm providing care for her. She's gonna have a big surgery next week. I'm gonna move over to her house. They happen to have a daughter who's also very ill. 
And so I'm going to move into their house and provide nursing care for her as she recovers from a big surgery. So when I use the term provider, it can be nurses. It could be a physical therapist providing um, physical medicine and recovery from an injury. It could be a uh, MD or, um, or doctor of osteopathy or a chiropractor providing their expertise to help someone else. That's what I mean by that. Okay, so um, he's going to talk about his providers, and I think and I think it's just super super cool um, to hear what he has to say. And I want you to be listening. And so this is the part when we're listening to patients talk. When we're watching this video in particular, Neil, I want you to be listening for what helped him. So he does a lot of talking about this didn't go well, and I did that. And then at the end of the video, he talks about what helped. And I think these are just good things to file in your brain. If I wanna help a patient, if I really wanna help someone that's ill, what kinds of behaviors and what kinds of skills are necessary? These are what in medicine we call soft skills. The hard skills are, do I know the words? Can I put an IV in? Do I know how to calculate drug dosages? Am I good at assessing what's wrong with someone? So that those are all the hard skills. The soft skills are, um, can I make you trust me in a minute? So this is a very important skill in medicine, being trustworthy and communicating that you're trustworthy. Okay, what does this mean also to you? Trustworthy. Such a good word. Trust means having a confidence and reliance to someone. So having confidence is trust and worthiness is value. So I know something of value and I am of value to my patients and hopefully you are of value to someone today. Okay, so you are trustworthy to someone today. Okay. All right, so let's just quickly review our vocab. Can you all see them here? Yes, it's clear. Muriel, are you sleeping or eating breakfast? Stop it. I said, are you uh, sleeping or eating breakfast? No, I'm paying attention. Oh, I see what you're doing. <laughs> Perfect. Glad. Thanks for thanks for muting. Okay, so cochlea. It's my cousin. He's like right next to me, so. Very nice, and um, I'm glad you're entertaining yourself while I'm talking. Okay, tomorrow you have the test, however. Cochlea, the cochlea. Is a uh, coiled hearing organ. So um, here's your ear. <laughs> here's your ear canal. I'm drawing a very fast picture. Okay, so here's my ear. Here's my tympanic membrane, and this is the ear canal, the hole in your ear. <coughs> Little kids put toys in there. Um, can a bug get in your ear? Yes, it can. Can it get in your brain? No, it can't because there's this nice drum here, uh, sort of a big, uh, big, a little round piece of, uh, I don't know what kind of tissue, it's like might be epithelial tissue. It's probably stronger than epithelial, probably has a little collagen in it, but it's like a drum. And so when sound waves come into the ear, it vibrates this drum back and forth and moves these three bones. 
okay? And that conducts, that conducts sound, uh, sound waves. And then on the inside of the cochlea, this coiled, looks just like a snail, there are little tiny hair-like neuron cells that vibrate back and forth and interpret that sound into um, data that essentially stimulates the auditory nerve and the brain can interpret it as being a meaningful sound. It can also detect frequency, like how high is the sound or how low, and volume. So an amazing um, organ of hearing. Some people, um, some children that are born deaf, something's missing. And what is missing is either zero of these little nerve-like hair cells or not enough to conduct sound. So if we test that child's hearing, they might have 20% of their hearing, or they might have 80%, but if they have a cochlear damage in terms of hearing loss, it has to do with these little nerve cells that are inside the cochlea. So what can be done about that? Those of you that are interested in working with children, what can be done about that? Oh, great question, Emily, I'll answer that. What can be done about it? So we can put a hearing aid on the child so we can um, simply make the sound waves bigger by putting a device right at the beginning of the canal that amplifies or makes it louder, right? What else can we do? We can actually just uh, now replace uh, these, uh, they don't take the cochlea out, but they actually add a device, and I'll show you a picture of it, that sits on the patient's head, like out here. It's like a um, little computer. And then they thread uh, an additional wire through the cochlea that takes the place of those hairs. So let's, let's look at that. I think I have a picture of it. Hold on. Yes, I have a picture of it right here. So um, you can see here, here's the internal implant. So this sits inside the patient's head and this processes the sound. And then look at where we brought this wire down. So here's the external ear, here's the ear canal, here's the tympanic membrane, here's the little bitty, um, these little bitty bones, these are semicircular canals having to do with balance, and this is the cochlea. So you can see here where the wire has been threaded down, and uh, this surgery takes about an hour, and it can restore hearing up to 85, 90%. It is also fantastically expensive, uh, just because the durability of the hardware, uh, the expertise needed in order to build uh, the processor, getting it fitted in to hold on to the patient's head, all um, take a lot of money. So answering Emily's question is, how far can earwax, she just put this in the chat, how far can earwax accumulate? So um, here's the outside of your canal. Um, it, can, it can accumulate all the way down to the tympanic membrane. It can even, uh, close off so you can't see the tympanic membrane with an otoscope, an instrument that allows physicians and nurses to look down inside the ear. Um, some people just genetically make lots of earwax. It's actually meant to be a protective coating. Um, swimmers, for instance, will often make a lot of earwax because the chlorine makes a little bit of irritation on the epithelial lining and then wax accumulates there. So you, you cannot get wax down in your middle ear. You cannot get it in your cochlea because the door, the tympanic membrane is there. Now, if a patient gets an ear infection, otitis, otitis, an inflamed ear, um, sometimes the tympanic membrane will break. So, Here's the tympanic membrane. 
And sometimes you'll look at it and you'll see that it has like what looks like a blown out tire. It has a hole in it. Um, you still probably won't get wax in there. It's, the patient will have a lot of pain and come to the doctor. All right, just a, just a fun picture. Oh yeah, so Kenneth, uh, earwax is actually an extremely common problem for family practice doctors and internists and nurse practitioners. And you, you're trying to look in a patient's ear to see their tympanic membrane, see if it's infected. And there's so much wax in there that you cannot see. And so they use what's called a loop. Uh, and a loop is a cool instrument that's teeny, weeny, and it's shaped just like that. And it can go right in here and loop out uh, that accumulated wax. Yeah. Any of you had an ear infection? That could, that's usually an infection in here. You've gotten an infection in here and you can also get one out here. All right. Oh, there's Luz. Hi, Luz. We're just reviewing vocab. So um, vesicles, that's another vocab term. Where have you heard this before? I'm going to draw you a motor neuron here. Okay. Oops. So here at the end bulbs where um, you are releasing neurotransmitter, if I were to blow up this picture big, the end bulb looks like this. And then neurotransmitters would come out in the synapse. Right, and the dendrites would pick up from the next neuron. So it's going from here to the next neuron. These are vesicles. Vesicle just means container. Container or little bag, vesicle. So this is a vesicle. Some patients don't have enough of them. Some patients have uh, nothing in them. What should be in them to transmit across to neuro, uh, which neurotransmitter is common? How about acetylcholine? How about the birthday party chemical? We all want that one, dopamine. Okay, so this is a acetylcholine space in the synapse. Released out of this vesicle, to here and received on this side by dendrites. Okay, got it. Um, the med term Milo is short for what? Spinal cord. So a myelogram is what? What's a myelogram? Picture of spinal cord. Yeah, picture of your spinal cord. So if you if you uh, have a big fall off a ladder, they may do a test called a myelogram to see if your spinal cord, your part of your central nervous system is intact. Okay, Emily has a question. Miss Ellis, can the patient fix their hearing device from making a sound by themselves? And can the doctor only fix the sound issue? So Emily, do you mean if it isn't working? I don't think she has her, her sound on. Oh, she does. Okay, so yes, um, the answer is both. So patients that have cochlear implants carry a remote control with them. And now I think you can put it on an iPhone app. 
which will allow them to get rid of background noise. Um, like say they go to Hard Rock Cafe. Okay, and there's a big dinner, it's 200 people and there's this pre-COVID, okay? And there's a lot of noise. They can pull out their phone and, and dial down the background noise so that they can hear voices better. Is that so cool? So yes, some of these things can be fixed. Um, if they're hearing uh, buzzing sounds from fluorescent lights, there's also an adjustment on that app so that they can fix that. Amazing, amazing technology. Who develops this in the United States? Bioengineers. So you go to engineering school, you major in biology, and there are these are device engineers that know how the human body works and what is required, and then devise a uh, machine to help a patient. What an amazing contribution to humans to be a device engineer. Um, so yes, the answer is yes. Now, if if there's something mechanically wrong, like the wire gets displaced on a cochlear implant, then the patient has to go um, in to see their doctor and have that either repaired or adjusted. That's such an excellent question, Emily. So um, eight, what does this mean? Asis or osis? Condition of. Condition of. What does sim mean? What does it mean? Join together. Let us uh, think of a word that uses that. It means join together. Uh, the study of language, medical language, is a fascinating one because it will help you in every part of your language, not just English, but everything. What does this word mean? Joined. Sound. So a symphony has, you know, violins and cellos and clarinets and bass players and um, French horns and all kinds of things joined together. Symphony to join. Um, to use a biologic word. Symbiotic, meaning join biology. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, the bacteria fragilis, that's the name of a bacteria group. There's a whole bunch of them. They um, live in your intestinal tract. And where do you get them? You get them from the environment. You have lots of bacteria. Yes. Yes, roots are joined, exactly. Uh, foundation also, Kenneth, it can mean. So fragilis uh, can help regulate your appetite, how much you eat. And if you don't have fragilis, or you take a ton of antibiotics and kill your fragilis, you might have trouble with your appetite. This is an example of joint biology. The joint function of a bacteria and the joint function of a human required behavior for survival. Okay? That's why we teach these words. Uh, if you have questions, need to ask them. Otherwise, I'm moving on. Verte vertebra, easy vertebrae. One of the bones in your back. Pro means what? What does pro mean? I think pro means for. Yes, before or for. 
Okay, so before, for ahead of all of these, uh, to project is to throw forward. So when the in focus machine right up there projects, it's throwing light forward to project. A probiotic, we just did this one, biology. So a probiotic is something that you eat that goes ahead of your biology to provide uh, nutrients ahead of your metabolism before a chemical reaction takes place. You eat probiotics to supply yourself with the raw materials for, for metabolism ahead of. Okay, good. Esthesia. What does that mean? I'll let you do it instead of me doing it. Oh, buddy. Oh. Yeah, feeling. So, um, what does this word mean? Paresthesia. Or anesthesia. Or hyperesthesia. Or hypoesthesia. Anybody have one of those for me? Alongside. Yeah. Paresthesias are, uh, they might say, oh, the patient has a parasthetic pain to the elbow. So they're feeling, they're feeling um, something right next to their elbow. Parasthetic pain next to. Anesthesia. Two kinds of anesthesia are in your reading. Anesthesia, general anesthesia, and local anesthesia. So anesthesia meaning what and meaning without. Very valuable. So one of my, this friend that I'm gonna take care of is gonna have a five hour surgery on Monday. And she is gonna be anesthetic asleep without feeling without memory. So amnesia without a amnesia without memory. Um, so there are two kinds. I think it's important for you guys to know two kinds. General anesthesia is inhaled generally or in an IV. You have to inhale anesthesia in order to be asleep for that long because the IV medicines don't last long enough. So the patient comes in the operating room, we lay them on the table, we put a little sleepy juice in their um, IV so that they're unaware of us and we're really nice to them, <laughs> just to be honest. Operating rooms when patients come in are like the patient is like, oh, how are you doing and how are you feeling about today? And, it's just so hospitable and people are so kind. And, and then the patient goes to sleep. And then if Uriel is the surgeon, he'll turn on his music after the patient is asleep. Okay, once the patient goes to sleep with their IV, then we put a mask on the patient's face and they inhale. And there's many, 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 drugs that are Rx is for, uh, abbreviation for drugs that keep the patient asleep. These are very, and these are developed by research pharmacists, all different kinds, depending on what kind of surgery you're having, what your health conditions are, how old you are, how much you weigh. So many, many things uh, determine that. Local anesthesia involves something that Uriel is afraid of. There it is. So a local anesthesia, if we're talking skin, 
and you're at the dentist's office, let's not put a hair in it since it's in your mouth. So the layers, the uh, needle comes into the patient's skin and it squirts out and wherever the medicine goes, this becomes with anesthetic because the drug that's inside the syringe provides this. And the drug could be uh, Novocaine, which lasts eh, two to three hours. It can be a drug called Marcaine, which lasts six to 24 hours. Cool, eh? Local anesthetic, meaning just a local area, your mouth, or sometimes the person that cuts their finger, cuts their thumb with a knife when they're eating a bagel. And we have to do like 20 stitches right here. We can just squirt anesthetic in there and numb their hand. <laughs> Uriel's not listening, Kenneth. I don't know. So I'm I'm teasing him, but he's not he's not here. He's missing it. Can't help you. Can't help you, Uriel. <laughs> <laughs> Because um, do you know the surgeons get to decide what music is played in the rooms? And so we've got, you know, Dr. Yeah, I do know that. I know that part. Finney. Classical music. And the next room is like, I don't know, Led Zeppelin. Yeah. Okay. We've got a couple words left. Everybody good on this? See why I'm helping you with your test tomorrow. Oto is here. So I'll give you some nice endings for that. Otitis. I don't know, Emily. I think it's because school's getting late. So Emily's asking why Uriel is being mildly noisy. Really, like Emily, I don't really think of that as noisy. To be honest, I've taught school so long. Like my noise receptors are like, that's not that much noise, but I don't know. I think it's because there's only like five days of school left. Okay, otitis. Ear. Inflammation or infection? Good. Otoscope, what does this mean? I think uh, instrument for viewing. Yeah. So it's a cool instrument, like a camera that we can put in, in your ear canal and we can look straight at your tympanic membrane. Very cool. And we can see all the wax in there and other nasties in there, whatever. Occupational hazard. Otoplasty, anybody know? I don't think we've had it. So an ear, a surgical repair of an ear. Plasty, like plastic surgery. An otoplasty is either a reconstruction of the uh, externa outside the ear or of the tympanic canal. So that's that, or maybe the tympanic membrane also would be rebuilt. Yeah, it's a surgical procedure. Okay. And then the last one you already know, I'm sure I just threw it on there again. So you would have to review it on not unkind un trustworthy un interested okay use that a minute of time all right okay any questions on vocab test tomorrow Yes, you will have a few minutes. Somebody just put this in the chat to me. 
can we have a few minutes at the beginning of class tomorrow to review all of this? And I said, of course, that is such a great idea um, because these things make a difference to grades. And um, we have one week, somebody also just asked me, how long am I accepting late work? I'm accepting late work until next Thursday morning. So um, we will take a big test on Tuesday, trivia on Monday. I'll take late work on Thursday. Friday is gonna be my grading day. I'll post up grades on Monday and that's the end of school. So that's a great question. Okay. Let us, that is not the one I wanted. Hang on one second. Let's find this very nice doctor. Okay, so we have a nice lady doctor who's going to talk to us about MS. And this, um, this lecture that she has going is an hour long. And so don't be horrified. Of course, I'm not showing all of it. I'm gonna show like the first 10 minutes, maybe eight minutes. And then um, I'll stop it and I'll show you the one where the patient talks about being diagnosed. Let me do this. If everybody's ready, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I don't know if everybody's here yet, but um, it is a little after six, so I guess we should get moving. So she's so a physician. I want to thank everybody for coming to the talk. Um, I am Christina Johnston. I'm a neurologist that works at Lakeshore Health Partners. Um, I've been in town practicing for the past year, so I've sort of met quite a few patients with MS in my first year of practice, and I was asked to do a talk to the community about a common problem that I've seen so far, and MS was like the first thing that popped into my head. I thought um, there would probably be some questions and things that um, there's been some new medications that have come out over the past few years, so I thought it would be a reasonable thing to review, just kind of do an overview of what is MS, uh, what are the symptoms of MS, how do we diagnose MS, and then some of the newer therapies that have come out over the past few years, I wanted to kind of touch base on those. And then there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end. I didn't get really, really specific about a lot of things because I knew there was going to be probably a lot of questions. So um, we'll, we'll have plenty of time for that at the end, OK? Also, I want to apologize ahead of time. I have a cough drop in my mouth because I'm getting over bronchitis, so I apologize <laughs> in advance. Um, OK, so I have nothing to disclose. I'm independently employed. I don't work for anybody else except for LHP. So just wanted to get that out of the way ahead of time. So what is MS? What happens with MS? Um, MS is a, a chronic disease in the, that affects the central nervous system. That means that the brain, the spinal cord, and also the optic nerves, which are the nerves that project to the eye and allow us to see, can be involved in this process. Um, everyone has an immune system that normally fights off diseases such as bacteria, as viruses, any sort of infection. And we think that the reason MS occurs is because there's a sort of case of mistaken identity, that the immune system mistakes the central nervous system as a foreign object or a foreign being, and it unfortunately attacks it and creates a problem. So statistically speaking, everybody likes to talk about statistics a little bit to get a general idea of um, how big of a problem this, this is in terms of our country. Um, it affects approximately, the statistics vary a little bit, but around 350 to 500,000. So um, 
people in the, just the United States alone. Worldwide, there's over 2.5 million individuals. And they estimate that in, in the United States alone, approximately 200 people per week are diagnosed with this disease. So it is rather common, um, more so than a lot of neurologic diseases. And it's probably affected a lot of, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people here in this room are affected. But even in the general community, most of us can say that we know someone or, or know of someone that has or um, a family member who's affected by MS or a friend or something. It's very, very commonly seen. Um, it typically affects males less than females. I, we don't really know, understand why that is, but the ratio is about two to three females to one male. Um, <clears throat> but that's kind of what we see. Typically, Caucasians are affected more predominantly um, than African Americans, although Caucasians, African Americans, and Hispanics are the most commonly affected. We don't always see it as much in Asians, although it can occur. Um, and there's a few other ethnicities that it's just not as common in. Um, children can be affected by this disease, although it's very rare. Um, in my training, I did see um, a few children that were affected, but mostly it occurs in our younger years. It kind of, the, the saying is that it affects a person when they're in the prime of their life, their 20s, their 30s, their 40s, their 50s, when they're really, you know, doing great, they're living their life, they're having children, they're getting married, and this happens. So, um, it tends to occur kind of in the northern areas of the world, um, the United States predominantly. And in the United States, it's even more in the upper portions of the country. As you get more south, it doesn't seem to be as prevalent. And that's the case across the world. So Europe, Japan, some of those areas are um, more often affected. Um, northern European countries specifically um, tend to have a higher predominance of MS as well. We're not really sure what that is. There's some theories about that. Um, that vitamin D or sunlight exposure could be playing a role in, in why that occurs more commonly than nearer to the equator because it's very infrequently seen in the uh, countries that are closer to the equator. Um, uh, the lifespan of a person with MS is generally about, on average, only a few years shorter than the, no the normal lifespan of a, of a typical American. So, you know, people who are diagnosed with MS still live a full life, only they have to sort of um, deal with the symptoms and the chronicity of this disease. So we still haven't identified exactly what the cause of the disease is, but there's a lot of research. So I just put this slide in because this is, um, I found this online, and it's a picture of many famous faces who have been affected by MS. Um, I think this is Terry Garr. Um, Annette Funicello, who just passed away, she was 70 years old, so she lived a long time with MS. Um, Richard Pryor, Ann Romney was in the news w with the last election and kind of brought a lot of attention toward MS and raised a lot of questions about it. Um, Meredith Vieira's husband, I think Richard Cohen is his name, he's um, a famous individual who's been in the news a lot about, you know, with attention toward MS. And um, Jack Osborne was diagnosed a few years ago, so he's been in a few um, newspapers and magazines over the past year or so that I've seen. So, but it is, it does affect anybody. So, so getting into a little bit more detail about specifically what is it. Um, so everyone's brain and spinal cord are, you know, consist of nerves, and the nerves are lined by a, a protective barrier called the myelin sheath. So the analogy that we use is that it's like an electrical cord with a protective, you know, insulation around the cord, and that's the case with the nerve. So what happens is that the, the normal nervous system connects the brain to the spinal cord to the nerves in the extremities, which connects with the muscle and allows us to do things like move, walk, feel our sensation, uh, visualize the world. Um, so when the immune system attacks the, the myelin or the covering of the nerve, it creates a disruption in the signal transmission. And so the signals can't get from the brain to the leg or to whatever is affected, and it creates a problem. So it usually um, happens when the inflammation occurs after the attack of the immune system on the myelin. So what happens with that is an attack, a clinical attack, a relapse, um, a flare, whatever term you choose to use or, or your neurologist chooses to use, but that's what it is. So it's a sudden onset of neurologic symptoms, meaning weakness, numbness, anything like that, that comes on and doesn't go away 
for at least 24 hours. For some people, it lasts for you know, three, four days. For some people, it lasts several weeks. And some people, it never, I mean, it can persist longer. So typically, though, that's not the case. Typically, it's a short term, a few days, a few weeks, and then it gradually starts to improve, which is why sort of people can have symptoms, and then they get better, and they ignore it, and they don't even know that they have um, symptoms of MS. Oftentimes, it happens when to a 24-year-old, 25-year-old, you know, a young person. They get better, and they don't think anything of it until something happens later. So that's the classic pattern that we hear of relapsing, remitting. So a relapse followed by a remission, meaning healing and going on with normal activity. So the symptoms can come on later in life, um, usually in the, in the setting of infection, if we're stressed out, if we're tired. And it's the result of the sclerosis left on the brain, or the sclerosis just means a scar. So after the brain is attacked or there's a, um, a damage to the nerve, there's a scar that forms as it heals, but that scar doesn't have the same capacity that it had prior to its damage. So it can leave residual symptoms going forward. Over the course of one's lifetime, you can see a decline in physical activity, you can see a decline in cognitive ability. So there are some chronic components to this disease, which is what you know, leads to the disability component. Um, you know, and, and managing these chronic symptoms is, you know, that's my job. <laughs> that's what the neurologist sort of uh, manages and, and deals with on a routine basis. So I put an illustration in here, and I actually tried to put it into my slide, but it didn't work. So I'm going to actually just go to the YouTube website. It's not my video, but I found it online, and I thought it was a fantastic illustration of the pathology that I just tried to explain. Multiple sclerosis, MS, is a disease that affects the central nervous system, the CNS, which consists of the brain, spinal cord, and optic nerves. Everything we do, whether it's taking a step, solving a problem, or simply breathing, relies on the proper functioning of the CNS. To understand how MS may impact the CNS, we must explore the disease at the cellular level. In the brain, millions of nerve cells called neurons continually send and receive signals. Each signal is a minute but necessary part of intricate CNS orchestrations that culminate in the actions, sensations, thoughts, and emotions that comprise the human experience. Normally, the path over which a nerve signal travels is protected by a type of insulation called the myelin sheath. This insulation is essential for nerve signals to reach their target. In MS, the myelin sheath is eroded, and the underlying wire-like nerve fiber is also damaged. This leads to a breakdown in the ability of the nerve cells to transmit signals. It is believed that the loss of myelin is the result of mistaken attacks by immune cells. Immune cells protect the body against foreign substances, such as bacteria and viruses. But in MS, something goes awry. Immune cells infiltrate the brain and spinal cord, seek out the myelin, and attack. As ongoing inflammation and tissue damage occurs, nerve signals are disrupted. This causes unpredictable symptoms that can range from numbness or tingling to blindness and paralysis. These losses may be temporary or permanent. That was a really nice illustration of what I tried to explain, but obviously I can't do the video as nicely as that explained it. But I thought that was a good explanation sort of of what the physiology of MS is, just so you can all understand if you weren't aware already. So again, why does it happen? We don't really know. There's a lot of theories out there, and there's been a lot of investigations about what specifically causes it. So I'm going to stop that share. Um, and pull up the one on the patient. If you want to watch this young physician um, talk about, um, you know, she's talking to a community group, so she's not talking to healthcare providers. So it's a really good uh, kind of lay discussion of um, what else happens. And I'm gonna put, come on, come on. The patient video up here so that you can see a, an actual patient who was diagnosed also talk 
and listen to him describe essentially what she was talking about of in terms of that myelin sheath is damaged by the immune system. It's different in every patient. So some patients have numb hands. Some people can't feel their feet. Some people have speech problems. Some people have an eyelid droop. And they, the symptoms are coming and going. It makes it very difficult to diagnose. Um, so I want you though to pay special attention to um, what it is at the end of this video that he says helps him. Did you ever think that getting the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis would actually be a relief? Neil Shulman is going to talk about his issues with misdiagnosis and the problem getting to the diagnosis when he had all kinds of vague and unusual symptoms that no one could explain. Unfortunately, it is not rare for the diagnosis of MS to take some time, so listen to Neil as he tells you about his story with diagnosis. Hi, my name is Neil Shulman. I was diagnosed with uh, multiple sclerosis about two years ago. Um, and this is just a little bit about the beginning of that journey um, because what I really found when I was being diagnosed was that um, you know, while the MS specialists are fantastic and know what's going on, I'm not so certain the rest of the medical community and everybody who's a neurologist out there does know what's going on in the world of multiple sclerosis, the world of treatments, and what it really means today to be diagnosed with MS. Uh, and I was diagnosed by a neurologist who was not a specialist in multiple sclerosis. Um, so in order to really understand kind of where I came from to get to this point, um, like many people who've been diagnosed with MS, I had a whole bunch of different issues throughout the years that kind of led to the diagnosis, most of which were misdiagnosed or not diagnosed. So. My MS story really starts back probably in uh, 2010 or 2011 when I started noticing problems with my eyes. Uh, I couldn't wear contact lenses anymore. I'd worn them for years since I was 13 years old. At this point, I was 25 and all of a sudden can't really wear contact lenses anymore. So I um, was looking at different doctors, going to different doctors, um, went to an ophthalmologist to try and you know, see what was wrong with me, and he looked at me right away and said, oh, I know what's wrong with you. Didn't really look at my eyes, didn't do much more than that. He goes, it's allergies, it's obviously allergies. I can look at your eyes and see that it's allergies. Now that I have MS, now that I've been diagnosed with MS, I know it probably wasn't allergies. So he gives me some hypoallergenic contact lens solution, tells me to buy those little eye drops that come in the one dose things, sends me on my way. Um, as you can imagine, didn't clear up the eye problems, just over time it kind of ended up getting better. Fast forward a couple of years, um, and I, in between having you know, some more problems with my eyes on and off, um, one day I lose feeling in my right leg, completely up and down the leg. So it seems odd to me. Um, I was probably 27, 28 at the time. I did what anybody else would have done, and I said, oh, this will probably go away. Well, it didn't go away. So I went to a doctor. I said to him, you know, I've lost feeling in my right leg, I can't feel anything. I think it might be related to a herniated disc, which I'd had since I was 22, 23. And he looks at me and says, oh, that's probably not it. And I was like, well, also, you know, my father had multiple sclerosis. I don't know if that kind of fits in with this, which should have probably been a clue. Um, to which he responded to me, you know, you look nervous. I was like, yes, I am nervous. I have no feeling in my right leg. And his response was, well, no, maybe that's what's causing it. It's, no, I'm nervous because I can't feel my leg, not I can't feel my leg because I'm nervous. So he hands me two prescriptions for muscle relaxers and Xanax and sends me on my way. Well, thank you, but not really sure that's going to help me very much. Um, it didn't help me very much. It actually kind of made things feel worse. So after that, doctor sends me on my way. A couple of, or a week or two goes by, still no feeling in my right leg. At this point, it starts to get even a little bit more worrisome. So. I go to uh, an orthopedist. And they do some tests, do an MRI on my back, come back, and they say, well, we, you do have this herniated disc, so maybe that's what's causing it. Um, 
their solution was to give me a uh, injection of steroids into my spine, which accidentally treated the MS symptoms, but again, doesn't really go towards solving the actual problem I was having. So at this point, we're getting pretty, we're getting a little bit closer to my MS diagnosis. So, but things are still happening to me that are odd. Um, my right hand started feeling clumsy when I was at work, really unable to use a mouse correctly, and then my, uh, my right pinky went numb. So, you know, I don't know what to do at this point. I feel like the steroid injection solved the leg problem, so I'm still not putting all this together. So I go to a, a hand and wrist specialist, and he says, oh, that, looks, that sounds like cubital tunnel syndrome. There's nothing really we can do for it outside of surgery, which you don't need, because it's not so bad yet. So just, you know, wait on it. It'll probably go away. So that one went away. Um, my, this whole time, my leg was kind of blinking in and out, and whether or not I had feeling on it, my wrist was not doing great. My hand and wrist were not doing great. And then um, it kind of all came to a head in late March, early April of, uh, of 2015, um, when I had vertigo. And this, I've never had vertigo before, but I can pretty much guarantee it was the worst case of vertigo anyone has ever had in history. I was stuck in bed for days at a time, unable to move. If I moved my head even a little bit, I was instantly sick. Um, so after a few days of surviving on nothing but grapes because it was all that I could eat and I couldn't move my head enough to drink, I felt well enough to go to the doctor. My GP sees me, says, yeah, this is vertigo. You need fluids, can't do it here, go to the hospital. Went to the hospital, was uh, was given fluids. They said, you've never had vertigo before. You're, at this point, I was 31. They're like, we're going to give you a CAT scan. CAT scan looked weird. Fast forward a few, fast forward about a month, and I get to the point where I'm finally being diagnosed with multiple sclerosis after MRIs and, and all the other tests and all that stuff, talking to a neurologist. He's a good neurologist, explained MS very well, but kind of the, the crux of my position here is being diagnosed with MS needs to be seen as a good thing. Uh, having MS, not a good thing, but being diagnosed is because you can finally get treated, you finally know why all this weird crap has been happening to you for years and years and years. Um, but because this neurologist who, he described MS exactly like you'd want to describe it, but when it came time to A, tell me that I had MS, and B, tell me about the treatments, I know now that it wasn't, it wasn't what it could have been, and it wasn't what it should have been. Um, kind of, I had my wife with me at the time, and he, I'm sitting kind of, you know, up on the, on the sort of table that they have you sit on. He sits down next to me, and he goes, this is so hard. This, it's just so hard. I hate having to do this. I hate, it's just so hard to have to tell you this. It, it, was, it was a little dramatic. It was a little over dramatic. Um, but he tells me that I have MS. My wife is sitting there next to me because she was pretty sure that's what I was going to be diagnosed with. I was kind of saying, no, you know, we don't know. It's probably not. We'll see. It's probably just something else. So she's hysterically crying. I'm sitting there stoically not crying, trying to kind of not freak out at the moment. Um, and I left his office feeling like that was it. The world was ending and I was on the fast track to being very disabled and just there was nothing that was going to happen. He gave me some pamphlets uh, for some of the medications that have been around for now, 20, uh, 20, more than 20 years, and kind of sent me on my way saying, choose a medication, let me know what you want to do, and, and get back to me. And when I left, I was just, I was absolutely devastated. I just, I thought, like I said, I thought that that was it. So I get home and all I can think of is about my wife and how we've been married now for two and a half years. She thought that she'd married somebody that she was going, that was going to be healthy and would be around with her for the next 40 or 50 years. And now I don't know what's gonna happen in the next four or five years. And all I could think of was how unfair it was to her and how unfair it was for me and for my family. Over the next few weeks, um, after speaking with um, a coworker who I had known also had MS, 
and um, some other people who I trusted, I ended up going to see a specialist. And during the examination, talking with the specialist and talking with his, uh, his PA, I did start to feel a lot better about it. Um, and <clears throat> they presented me with a lot of good options for medications, a lot of current options for medications, took me through kind of in more detail where it was, but there was one moment that I'll never forget, and it's not poetic, and it's, you know, it's, it's definitely not, you know, something that's a, a lyrical uh, masterpiece, but when the PA looked at me and said, you know, when we have patients that have to be hospitalized, we're devastated because it happens so infrequently. And just hearing that, and that was what I thought about for the rest of the appointment, and that's what I thought about on my hallway home, because that's when I thought, you know, maybe it's not going to be what I originally thought it was. Maybe I'll be okay. And that was the first time in, a, in about a month since I'd been diagnosed that I actually had hope for what was going to happen in the future. Um, so it all comes around to what I was kind of started out with. Being diagnosed with MS should be a good thing. And I think there needs to be better communication in the medical community, um, especially with other neurologists who are not specialists, because many times we're diagnosed by people who aren't specialists and who aren't dealing with MS patients every day. Um, that being diagnosed needs to be seen as a good thing because you can start getting answers and start figuring out exactly what's going on with you and start a treatment and get it stopped. Thank you. So he does an awesome job there of um, just telling the truth of what it's really. Um, what did the PA who told him about um, how he feels about people being hospitalized, what did he provide for the patient? It's a very important part of healthcare. It's a great question. Um, you can put that in the chat. Um, but it's very important to think about if you're considering a healthcare career, that whether it's somebody with MS or someone who has a very ill baby or child or someone with cancer, that providing is not just a matter of learning about all the words and explanations and understanding that the myelin sheath gets attacked by the immune system, but he provides something else. He provided medicine for sure, Kenneth. What else did he provide? It's something that you cannot touch, which is hope for the patient to not think, um, you know, my life is really done. So I do that to provide the human side of medicine. Please, please read in the little blue box for sure in your reading about exactly what, uh, what multiple sclerosis is and make sure you know what part of the neuron is affected. So um, I'm going to let you all go. Um, if you still have late work and you came in late and you want to turn things into me, of course, it's fine. If you have a question, you can put it in the chat, um, or you can, um, stay and ask me. So see you tomorrow for the test. Uh, tomorrow's test, Emily, is just on midterms. Bye. I'm going to, I tried, Emily. I went back and copied that video and it still shows. I'll try again or I'll call IT. So frustrating to me. No, it's not gone. It's on my YouTube channel. Um, so I might send you the link for my YouTube channel. I'll try that. Okay. See you guys later. <laughs>